when my kids were real little, I used to play a game with them. I'd give each one of them a stick, and I'd say, you break that. Of course, they could, but easy. Then I'd say, tie them sticks in a bundle, try to break that. Of course, they couldn't. Then I'd say, that bundle, that's family. Rose, darling, I've got to go see Lyle. I'm a netto with Salvin, and he's driving his lawnmower. What are you setting out to do here? Alvin, you're going to get blown right off the rope. How long have you been on the road? Five weeks. Haven't you been scared being alone? Well, ma'am, I fought in the trenches in World War II. Why should I be scared of an Iowa cornfield? Are you running away? My family hates me. Well, of course, warm bed and a roof sounds a mite better than eating a hot dog on a stick with an old geezer that's traveling on a lawnmower. Where'd you come? From Iowa. My God, you must be thirsty. Sit there and drink it a little bit, Richard, on your own. Then you can just go forward into just staring at the fire. And uh, that's how it ends. I just hold steady there. Okay, so I'll say up to the fire, uh, you know, look at John, and, and uh, John will come in, and we're both in the car. Okay. And then um, this chair, of course, has to go right, away. Right, right. And make it, um, hey, I want to make it a little bit more difficult to get that chair out, so it's just like, you know, it's okay. Kind of, you know, just and John, you can come on in. I noticed your campfire. Brought you some dinner. Beef potatoes? Well, thank you kindly. Uh, I've had my dinner, but would you care to join me? Sure. Thank you. And just moving up now to you, Richard. And you're looking at John. And action, John. 
John. I noticed your campfire. Brought you some dinner. Big loaf of potatoes. Oh, thank you kindly. I've had my dinner, but uh, would you care to sit a spell? Sure, thank you. So you saw him, he's okay? I only saw him that once. Uh, I haven't heard anything since. Good. I, I think it'll work. Well, thank you, uh, Dave. I noticed your campfire. Brought you some dinner. Meatloaf, potatoes. Well, thank you kindly. I've had my dinner, but would you like to sit a spill? Oh, sure, thank you. B Mark. Okay, Richard, you're looking at uh, John coming in. We talked to each other and, until we went to sleep. Talk about planets, and stars, and whether there might be somebody else like us out in space, places we wanted to go. Chuck. Yeah. yeah. So you're kind of like this. He wanted to do everything on his own. He accepted a little bit of help, but uh, reluctantly. And uh, he, uh, he made up his mind he was going to get back there to see Lyle. And he did it. He was lucky to make it with the obstacles and the trucks almost turning him over, you know, and it was pretty thrilling.
Oh, it's great. I love the open country. And they, we timed it to have the corn crops coming in. And it was just those big machines, you know, they they go 20 foot wide down through that corn. And it's really something. I, I really enjoyed that part of it, watching them. He sure did uh, right by me on it. He was very patient. It's, it, it worked fine. I can't say anything but good about the way he handled me on that film. Richard Farnsworth is so amazing in this film. He is the film. And he's just, I think you could just watch him read the phone book. You know, his face is so expressive and he's got so much, he's filled with humanity. And he's such a kind and humble man and you can just read everything that he's thinking. You see it in his eyes. And it's an, I think it's an, an astonishing uh, performance and for a, a role like that to come along at this time in his life is really really spectacular he was born to play this role we're so thrilled you know it's a story about redemption and and um, and there's this wonderful, loving relationship between the character I play, Rose, and 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 him. I think it's about a man who's coming to the end of his life, and he wants to know he's that he's going to go with with no great regrets. I never had any idea how wonderful it would be to work with him. Now I understand why everybody that's ever worked with him is so devoted to him. He's uh, just delightful on set. He laughs a lot and he treats people with such love and respect and he knows exactly what he wants. He's very, <laughs> he's a character. What made me want to do it is what made me want to do every other film, is you fall in love with something. And also, there's things in the air. You know, the world is always changing, and there's things in the air. And so this story comes along at this moment. You fall in love with the story, and it jives with something in the air, and, and you're going. You're boogieing, and, and that's it. And in this particular story, it was primarily the emotion coming out of these characters and this story that, that got me. Richard Farnsworth was born to play Alvin Strait. And uh, Richard doesn't consider himself an actor. He came through the rodeo and stunt work, and yet he's one of the, the greatest actors, you know, around and he has the ability to make things real. And, and when he, you know, um, says something or, or feels it, he feels it, you know, um, greatly. And, and it comes through every part of him. I always wanted to work with Sissy. And, um, you know, you, in, in casting, your, your job is to try to find the right person for this role. And, and there again, Sissy, you know, jumped out. And she's a great actress. And it's a, it's a delicate role. And um, uh, she made it, it look easy. We met a lot of people that he met. And we traveled the route that he went down. And um, it took us just about the same amount of time shooting as it took him to um, uh, you know, make the trip.
I first met Freddie uh, on The Elephant Man. He shot uh, The Elephant Man, and uh, we became, you know, good friends. And uh, then he uh, shot Dune, my next film, and then we didn't, you know, work together for a long time. But um, it was perfect that Freddie, you know, shoot this particular picture. Um, not only is he a great DP, and I have a, you know, good relationship with him, but uh, he's 80 years old. And um, uh, it just was one more, you know, proof that um, these, these old timers um, have the stuff. And um, we came in uh, under schedule um, with a lot of, lot of old people in the picture. Angelo Badalamenti is, um, you know, his, you know, he's, he's a classically, you know, trained uh, musician and uh, composer, but um, a lot of people are that, and, and, but Angelo can find emotion in, in music, and um, so uh, all I have to do really is is um, talk to Angelo, and now the talking is you know kind of shorthand, and and we just sit together, um, him playing and me talking until you know it's 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 um, he's creating a, um, a a feeling that you know sits you know with the film, and um, once that thing is caught, he 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 takes off. It's a story of a man um, and his uh, immediate family, um, and it's a story of, you know, uh, it's a story of forgiveness, really. I think it was just the stubbornness of uh, the stubbornness of the character Alvin Strait uh, insisting on making this trip uh, under very difficult circumstances that really, really uh, caught my admiration and, and imagination. And there seemed something very simple and sweet and, and willful and, you know, age be damned about it. It was great. I wrote the screenplay with uh, John Roach, and as part of the research, he and I went to Alvin's home in Lorenz, Iowa, and um, we drove a little more quickly Alvin's route from there to Mount Zion, and uh, there were very few people that he had contact with along, that's one of the things we discovered uh, along the way. We were lucky in that in Claremont, Iowa, uh, we met the people on whose yard he um, in whose yard he stayed for a week when he was having some problems with his lawnmower, and that was a real gold mine for us because they were the only people who knew his habits uh, on the road and and what he wore and where he slept, and that was great. They were our closest contact to what kind of a man Alvin was, and they were very helpful. We went to their home in Newton, Iowa, which is outside of Des Moines and spent a day with them, John and I did, and, um, uh, uh, you know, they just told us everything they could remember about their father, and, and, you know, with a big family, it's a different memory for the older ones than it is for the younger ones, but the most beautiful thing about that visit was the, the, the idea of, of putting Diane's character, Rose, in the story it came from that meeting, meeting Diane, who's a beautiful soul. That just a beautiful vision, a beautiful, you know, tremendous talent as a filmmaker and uh, sound and music married with the visuals that all of which was his design. It, it, uh, it was a beautiful thing to have David Lynch make this. We knew it wasn't going to veer over into sentimentality and, um, and that it was going to be lyrical and beautiful and graceful as, as it is.
One, your eyes are bad. That's why you don't drive your car. A two, Uncle Lyle I lives in Wisconsin, which is a three and something miles away. You would have to stay all night in Des Moines. And then there is no bus to Zion. Three, your hips are bad. You can hardly stand for two minutes. And when you stand up, this is the sound you make when you stand. <laughs> A four, you are at 73 years old. You were born when a come as Coolidge was a president of America. You are a century years old, Dad. And I cannot drive you there. Rose, darling, I'm not dead yet. Rosie, I, I've got to go see Lyle. And I, I've got to make this trip on my own. I know you understand. I guess so. Look up at the sky, Rosie. The sky is sure full of stars tonight. When my kids were real little, I used to play a game with them. I'd give each one of them a stick and one for each one of them. And I'd say, you break that. Of course they could, real easy. Then I'd say, tie them sticks in a bundle and try to break that. Of course they couldn't. Then I'd say, that bundle, that's family. I got parts and labor that add up to 247.80. Well, I'd say that's a little bit heavy for light work, don't you think? I've got an old man's eyes, but uh, I'm noticing some new tire here. Well, now, uh, we got those off a of resell, but the treads are good. Well, friend, are you charging me for good or for new? Uh... 
Thorvald? Uh, we can make an adjustment there. Well, I think the adjustment should be about $30. Is that what your pencil's saying? And uh, about the labor, I appreciate that you boys have done some real time on this, but of course a man's got to ask when he's working with twins, especially a bickering pair. How much working was fighting? You got that right. Shut up, Danny. If I was to judge by this joyous affair I saw today, I would calculate maybe 20% taken off the labor. Anything else, mister? Whatever happened between you two? Story as old as the Bible. Cain and Abel. Anger. Vanity. You mix that together with liquor. You've got two brothers that haven't spoken in ten years. Well, whatever it was that made me and Lyle so mad don't matter anymore. I want to make peace. I want to sit with him, look up at the stars, like we used to do so long ago. <laughs>